Hello and welcome to Wesley Church in Reading to, as you join us today. Peter Frank will be our speaker today and his subject is Lifting Souls. Before that, we'll have a prayer. God of comfort and compassion, through Jesus, your Son, you lead us to the water of life and the table of your bounty. We have received the tender love of your Good Shepherd, who died for us and rose again to life, to be our life, our strength, and giver of your grace, that we might care for your flock, love as you do, and give as he gives. In our worship be amongst us, excite our spirits in praise and adoration, and lift our minds in wonder, and may we be in your presence today and always. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Revelation chapter 7 verses 9 to 17 The great multitude in white robes. After this I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they? And where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne 
will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamp at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Amen. One of the joys of the church calendar is that Easter continues for a number of weeks after our celebration of Easter Sunday itself. What a shame the chocolate from the Easter eggs doesn't last quite so long. But despite that, we continue to dwell in resurrection hope, to live as Easter people, fueled also by the beauty of springtime and the love of God revealed all around us. In all of this goodness and hope, the compilers of the lectionary have offered us a reading from Revelation, showing us a view of the perfection of worship in heaven. What makes that reading so remarkable? Is it the sheer number of worshippers? Is it the dazzling whiteness of their apparel? Is it the enthusiasm of their worship as they praise God with loud voices? Is it the presence of the angels? Or is it the diminutive figure of the Lamb at the centre, the object of our worship? How do you respond to reading this passage from Revelation, this perfect worship of heaven? Part of me, to be honest, finds it jarring with our current life experience. Pictures of crowds from every nation and language worshipping God in unity seems to clash with my sense of the fragile state of international relations today, which seems to threaten to unravel before us. The promise of no more famine and drought, no more yielding to the sun in the dry, dry desert, run counter to our lived reality of the devastation to lives and the numbers of refugees from, clim the, from the current climate crisis and the seeming indifference of rich nations. Where is this God who wipes away every tear from their eyes? And yet, and yet, is this perfect worship of heaven not the worship of our churches week by week? OK, John is painting a picture in words of a vision granted to him of the new heaven and the new earth, which is beyond our limited world view of time and space. We can only imagine it. And it does seem too good to be true to be breaking out into our world as we live today. But it is the stuff of Easter. We do proclaim resurrection belief in a living God and in the loving shepherd who lays down his life as a lamb sacrificed on our behalf to save us from the ravages of evil. And we do have the reality of heaven before us and within us. We worship because we are, in fact, washed clean, perfect before God. And as we worship, we are joined by countless others from all nations of the earth and from all ages. Alone in my front room, or as one of a few in a chapel or a church, this may seem like a huge leap of imagination. But if it were not so, for what are we praising God today? Resurrection life, albeit unfulfilled in our era and seemingly unfulfillable, gives us the impetus and the drive to, to bring forward an agenda of love and sacrifice in a difficult world. God's glimpses of the completeness of things give us the reason and essence of Easter and provide our reason for hope and faithfulness today. But it is not merely an intellectual exercise. Our hope must spring from something stirring within us.
chapter 10 verse 22 to 30 further conflict over jesus claims then came the festival of dedication at jerusalem it was winter and jesus was in the temple courts walking in solomon's colonnade the jews who were there gathered around him saying how long will you keep us in suspense if you are the messiah tell us plainly Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you do not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Amen. When was your soul last lifted within you? Perhaps there was a moment of delight at watching a young child at play. Perhaps an act of love came from an unlikely source. Perhaps you were stirred into praise at the sheer beauty of the natural order of the world. Whatever it was, whenever it was, in that moment, heaven was glimpsed. This is how God intends it to be. And when our souls are lifted, we know that God is in heaven and God is in this world and God is with us and our place is with God. In John's Gospel, we learn to be wary of the Jews. 
It is for good reason. In the very next verse after those that we've read, we read of the Jews taking up stones to stone Jesus because of his blasphemy. He had claimed to be equal to God. And ultimately, of course, it was the Jews that handed over Jesus to the Romans to be crucified. But the picture is not entirely without nuance. True pictures, of course, rarely are. And when we think that they are, it's usually because we're trying ourselves to justify our worldview in the face of challenge by somebody else's. Just before our reading from John today, we read that the Jews were divided themselves because of Jesus' words. They were not a consistent force for evil, set against everything Jesus said and did. Indeed, it is John who records in his Gospel that one of the Jews followed Jesus, Nicodemus himself. So it is that in our reading from John today, we do not read of the Jews' conversation with Jesus as being entirely hostile. They are wavering in their judgment of him and are not of a single mind. And it is a big question that they are deciding upon. Is this man the Messiah? In verse 24, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Now, I'm no scholar of New Testament Greek, but I do have in my possession a family treasure, and I treasure it indeed an old Young's analytical concordance of the Bible, and it's been passed down through generations of the family. In it is listed, listed each word in English, certainly as they were written down in the old authorised King James Version. And against each word, there are separate entries where they are translated from different words in Greek. Where our modern version of the Bible uses the word suspense, how long will you keep us in suspense, Jesus? The authorised version uses doubt. How long will you, will you keep us in doubt? But the Greek word thus translated in, appears only in this verse through the whole of Scripture. And the literal English translation of the word from the Greek is lift up the soul. So the Jews in their question to Jesus are actually asking him how long is he going to keep on lifting up their souls, raising their hopes, giving them such an inner yearning for the things of God without also giving them hard proof of him being God's anointed one. It seems as if they're saying when you talk like this, Jesus, about being the good shepherd, and when we see the signs you make, healing the blind, for example, our hearts really do skip a beat. Our souls are lifted. Praise wells up inside us. Surely God is at work in you, and we hear God's word in your words. But, but then we catch ourselves, Jesus, because we are leaders. We have responsibility. We cannot be carried away because, because that wouldn't be right. So please, just tell us, can we really rely on you? Faith, of course, is not like that. Faith is to believe in what is unseen. Any of us can believe in the love of a parent or a child or a friend who is here with us, demonstrating that love by pushing themselves out for us, by relying on us, depending on us. But faith is needed to believe the same of Jesus. He is here with us, but we cannot prove it to a sceptic until their heart is changed and they know from within, they hear the call of their yearning, hungry souls. Jesus tells the Jews that he has told them and has given them all the evidence that they need. But still, they do not believe. They cannot let go of the false certainties upon which they have built their lives and established their reputations and status. 
And in reality, it's no easier for us today than for the Jews of Jesus' era. God continues to speak into and act in the world and our lives, and our souls are lifted within us. But it is only when we listen to that word and to our soul's delight and make the step of faith into the unknown do we dare to believe it, that in in that do we dare to believe in that presence that God can prove our salvation deep within us? My sheep hear my voice, says Jesus, I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. It is only when we hear that voice, when when our souls are lifted within us is the proof of Jesus' word found to be true in our lives. So how do we hear that voice of Jesus? It speaks into our lives, it touches parts of us deep within us. Sometimes it's in the words and actions of another person. Sometimes as we sit and reflect upon the Bible. Sometimes as we spend time noticing God's creation in our gardens, by our rivers, in the countryside. And even sometimes it is as we do something we know to be good and helpful for someone else, without thought of being godly. And then Jesus speaks within us. That was right. That was of me. And when our belief in and love for Jesus is real and strong, then we believe in the Lamb who dies, who is enthroned, and before whom all the nations will worship as one people. For he will then lead our lives to the springs of the water of life, and God will wipe away our tears. It is a vision of what is yet to be fulfilled, but it is also a hope for today, born of the reality of eternal life in us through faith. I pray that your souls will be lifted as you meet with Jesus today. Amen. Thank you.
let us pray. Wise and loving God, you call us to live in obedience to your will, that we might have life in all its fullness. We pray for ourselves that, inspired by your Holy Spirit, we may give ourselves in obedience to you. We pray for those in power who have to make difficult decisions which will affect the lives and well-being of so many. We pray for those who are the victims of warfare or poverty who are calling out to us for aid. We pray for those we know who are ill or anxious or bereaved, who need to be aware of our care for them. We pray for those involved in the upbringing of children who are trying to show them right from wrong. We pray for the church as we face the challenge of Christian living in a modern society and world. Wise and loving God, emptying yourself of all but love, you came in Christ to be alongside us. May we follow his example by being obedient to the way of love, even to death itself. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
may our souls be lifted up this day and every day as we know the love of God through the risen Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.